it, it's a beautiful venue. I mean, here we are in this beautiful place with nature and Aspen is so, such a great place to be and I really want to thank the Institute. Uh, John, thank you very much for organizing this meeting and uh, for inviting me to be the Walter Orr Roberts lecturer. So just a, a quick thing about Walter Orr Roberts. Uh, as you heard, he was an astronomer, physicist, but he was a lot more than that. He was an educator. He was a philanthropist, uh, and he was one of the first people to really ma uh, make big connections with climate and, the, uh, and health and, cha and climate change and its impact on the planet. And, and there's something that's actually pretty special about this guy, which I, I think many people probably do not know, and that is that you know here he's an atmospheric scientist, and he had the, uh, the honor of having an asteroid named after him. <laughs> 3428 Roberts is an a asteroid that was named after him. And just as a reminder, the asteroid belt is between Jupiter and Mars. There's uh, thousands of asteroids. There's about 200 asteroids that are 60 miles in diameter or more. There's one asteroid named Ceres that's almost a dwarf planet. It's like nearly 1,000 miles in diameter. And these asteroids actually have some impact on climate in the US and the world because there's a, a little bit of uh, f occasional collisions occur out there and there's uh, asteroid dust that gets into space and there's a light rain of asteroid dust that's occurring all the time on our planet. And of course, occasionally asteroid debris can come down as meteorites and as shooting stars and they're, it's kind of beautiful to know that this, the, these beautiful things in the sky uh, can come from this asteroid belt. What's uh, interesting though, is that not always are asteroid collisions beneficial or beautiful that lead to flaming, you know, uh, meteorites and uh, shooting stars, but there was an asteroid collision that we're pretty certain about that played a role in the extinction of the dinosaurs. And a fragment of an asteroid of between 10 and 15 kilometers in diameter actually hit the Earth. The story about the discovery of that was, is really lays, goes to Walter Alvarez, who was a geologist working in Italy. And he was very curious about this zone, the Cretaceous zone, that was filled with marine animal fossils and lots of fossils. And then the tertiary peri period, where there was a, suddenly a very significant reduction in fossils. And he was interested in this boundary, which was called the KT boundary for the Cretaceous tertiary boundary in which there was this layer of clay or kaolinite from the Cretaceous and there was a layer of coal from the tertiary and there was this little band that separated and he was curious what was, was involved with that transition that led to this massive uh, reduction in fossils uh, and in extinction of different fossils of, of different species. And his, he happened to be lucky that his father was a Nobel laureate in physics. And he talked to Louis Alvarez about how to, uh, to actually measure the age of this, this little band to try to figure out when, how long it, this, this band of, of this layer took to form. And they tried different, measuring different metals like, or different uh, elements like beryllium to try to figure out if they could do it. And finally, Louis says, you know, there's, you can use iridium because iridium really comes from uh, outer space. It comes from asteroids. And, and uh, star debris that comes in, and it comes in at a fairly regular uh, rate. So you can actually use that to actually time how long it took that layer to form. But when they measured the iridium, it was like 30 times higher than expected. And initially they were thinking maybe it's a supernova, a star explosion that had, had led to this uh, impact. But they uh, measured plutonium, which is present in star debris, uh, but it's not met, present in asteroids, and it was negative. And so then, the two of them came up with the idea that there was an asteroid impact. And when they presented this in 1980, there were uh, a lot of people who were doubtful that this really was a, that played a role. But they were able to show that at this KT boundary in different areas of the world, like in Netherlands and Italy, that this iridium band was present. And then, of course, the question was, if there was an asteroid impact, where did it hit? And then a, a few, uh, there was a graduate student who read this paper and immediately started wondering about this crater that was uh, being uh, had been discovered just off the Yucatan. And it was, uh, this is the, land, the shoreline, and he was able to, this is a gravity map that actually kind of, you can see the arc of it, 
And it, there was uh, evidence of this 180, millimeter, or 180 kilometer crater, and there were these like sinkholes that kind of fell along the rim, and they were able to find shocked quartz and other things that looked like an uh, asteroid impact. And now it's pretty clear that there really was an asteroid uh, impact there, that uh, it hit the Earth at 50,000 miles per hour. It had an impact uh, that was uh, thought to be about a billion times the, the uh, power of, of the Hiroshima blast, atom bomb. And it led to an immediate infrared radiation, uh, tremendous amount of heat that, was, uh, that occurred immediately that could kill a lot of life. But then it was followed by, and tsunamis and earthquakes, and, but it was followed by an impact winter in which the dust got up into the atmosphere and basically uh, there was a drop in temperature of about, of about seven degrees and uh, centigrade, and that was enough with the, with the darkening of the sky that plants started dying and, and there was an extinction of 75% of all animals at that time. And uh, it was at that time, though, that some, some mammals survived, and of course many, many species survived, but particularly small mammals that could hide in burrows and, and that uh, did not have to eat a lot uh, as opposed to the large animals that, that required higher energy demands. Now, the impact of that asteroid and, the, and that transition really emphasizes this really important discovery in, uh, by Darwin, you know, of his, his presentation of the theory of evolution, in which he, he says it's not the st strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It's the one that's the most adaptable to change. And when we think about the key aspects for survival, one is to really be able to find or store food and water, uh, and uh, another is to be able to reproduce, and the uh, third one would be to avoid predators and survive catastrophes. But as this, uh, you know, as you think about the survival strategies, what happens if the environment is so stressful that, you, that no matter what you do, you can't, uh, you, 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 you can't with your current, you know, no matter what wit or verve or or luck you have, you're in trouble. And, and so as environment continues to change, species have to e learn how to evolve to survive. And what's great about life is that uh, reproduction, what's great about life is that uh, th there's the versatility is that uh, reproduction does not occur perfectly. And if reproduction did occur perfectly, there, everyone would be the same and it would be very hard to evolve. But what's great about our about life is that there, uh, the, the process of replication is imperfect. And because of that, there's errors that occur uh, in replication with about one error in DNA pa base pair for every million base pairs that are copied. And as a result, everyone when they're born carries about 60 mutations that were not present in, the, in either parent. And these, these are new mutations, and usually they're not very significant, not very important, but sometimes they may carry a, a survival advantage. And not only is it can be a single base pair mutation, but there are also sometimes where people can, where you can get a duplication of a segment of DNA, and those are easier to measure. And they, uh, they also, uh, what's great about a duplication is uh, you still have your regular gene, and now this duplication can mutate as, you know, as, it, as happens and can lead to new, new genes and so forth, and new, even new gene families. So this idea of, of evolution uh, you know, uh, was really amplified by Stephen Jay Gould, who suggested that you know, evolution doesn't have to occur just at a regular level, but it can occur uh, dur during periods of upheaval when survival is borderline, mutations may be more likely uh, to be advantageous. And so that during those period of, of rapidly changing environment, that there is often a, a speeding of evolution because the mutations that occur randomly during that time may, may carry advantage. And he called this punctuated equilibrium. Now, in the, uh, in the evolution of primates and in the evolution of humans, uh, it's possible by using molecular biology techniques to actually time when the uh, speciation separated, for example, for the old world monkeys versus the, the beginning of the apes and so forth. And so it's interesting that there was this period of time 
right around the mid-Miocene where there's a lot of speciation and changes going that uh, Stephen Jay Gould might have suggested would be a period of rapid evolution. And now we can look back and actually time the duplications in the primate genome. And, they, and uh, this one group uh, re published this. And you they timed when, the, when these duplications occur. And you can see right around 12 million years ago, there was this spike in evolutionary, in, 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 in accelerating evolution. And at times, with this period of speciation. So I became interested in this because we were uh, studying a mu uh, uh, uric acid. And there's a mutation in uric acid metabolism called uricase. And this mutation occurred in the old ape lineage, the, the, great, the great ape lineage, lineage, and also in the lesser ape lineage. And so uh, it, one uh, mutation was timed to occur right around 12 million years ago, and another one around 15 million years ago. And so both mutations led to the loss of a gene called uricase. And the fact that they, were, that they occurred in parallel around the same period of time really suggests that that mutation must have carried some kind of advantage, some kind of natural selection advantage. So what exactly is that mutation? Uh, uric case is, a, is an enzyme that degrades a substance called uric acid, a substance called uric acid, into a, a lantoin. So this, this is an enzyme that's expressed by many, many uh, species. It's expressed by ar archaeobacter, and, and it's expressed by uh, bacteria, it's by, by plants, by uh, animals. It's really a, a very important enzyme. And uric acid is basically a product of, of nucleic acid degradation, like DNA, RNA, ATP. So uh, it's a very basic um, a, a, a substance that comes from our DNA breakdown and RNA breakdown. And it's, uh, it's really, everybody has it. We have it in our blood. We have different levels of it in our blood, depending on different things. But this mut normally, in most species, uric acid is degraded so that we have only small amounts of uric acid in our blood. Uh, but when you mutate this, when you uh, have this mutation, the uric acid goes up. And so in man and apes, this uric acid is higher than in most other mammals that do not have this mutation. And everyone in this room is a knockout for uricase. So we're, we're all a knockout, just like we, we're a knockout for vitamin C synthesis. So we're basically double knockouts. So, so what does uric acid do? So, so uh, you know, in different species, uric acid has different functions. And in, 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 you know, it's interesting, butterflies use uric acid to make uh, the pigment in, in their wings, especially the white pigments. Uh, the, the crystals are used by fireflies to help uh, amplify the, the light, to magnify the light they, from their fluorescence. Uh, this, this little flatworm, which is a platinurius, it's, it uses uric acid as a pheromone. And it will actually release uric acid and attract the male that will release sperm in response. Uh, and of course, uric acid is in guano. Which, uh, and it's been thought that the uric acid is playing a role there because it's allowing the animal to get, the birds, to get rid of nitrogen without much water. So it's a way to really get rid of nitrogen in, as a precipitate as opposed to uh, other, other ways. And so they use that to, to conserve water. But in humans, what does uric acid do? I mean, in humans, uric acid is thought to be the cause of gout. It is the cause of gout. And it's this terrible inflammatory arthritis that occurs in, frequently in the big toe, but in other joints. And it de definitely so doesn't sound like a, an advantage to have a high uric acid, does it? And what's more, the people who have gout tend to be overweight, 80% of them. They tend to have high blood pressure, heart disease, cardiovascular disease. Uh, you know, it's not good to have a high uric acid if you have gout, you, and you, you know, because it's linked with all these bad conditions. So my interest in uric acid and, the, and the, my collaborators' interest uh, came from, in part from the fact that we were interested in sugar and how sugar causes uh, obesity and does it cause obesity and does sugar cause diabetes or doesn't it cause diabetes. And we were interested in sugar and the reason we were 
uh, interested in sugar is because uh, it, there's a, a, I'm a kidney doctor and high blood pressure doc, and it, well, there's also evidence that sugar may be involved in kidney disease and high blood pressure. But what's interesting about sugar is just to remind you, sugar is sucrose, and it's a dual, it's a disaccharide of fructose and glucose. There's this uh, sweetener called high fructose corn syrup that is a mixture of fructose and glucose. So here the fructose and glucose are bound together, and then when you eat it, they separate in the gut. And, and here they're already uh, freely uh, mixed. They, they don't actually, they're not actually bound together. And then fructose is also present in honey and fruit, which of course we think of as, as healthy. But we've been doing some studies and we found that when we gave fructose to animals, we could actually induce things like obesity and, and insulin resistance in animals. And what was really interesting was that when we, uh, when we give fructose to animals, serum uric acid goes up. And it was known for, in humans too that if you eat fructose, your serum uric acid goes up within minutes. And we actually did studies in humans that showed that just a single soft drink will raise your uric acid in about 10 minutes. And so here was a link with uric acid and sugar. And we, we went on and started studying. The way that the, the, the uric acid goes up is that fructose is the only sugar that depletes energy before it produces energy. So it will actually, you know, there's energy is known as ATP, and fructose gets uh, phosphorylated. It gets broken down by, by eight, phosphate gets added to this, and in the process, you lose ATP. And in, with most uh, foods like glucose, or most sugars, if it gets phosphorylated, there's this kind of protection system where if the ATP levels start to fall in the cell, the, the reaction stops. But with fructose, the reaction doesn't stop. It just phosphorylates it on. So the ATP levels can fall, and that leads to uh, the uh, AMP levels that go up. And there's this degradation pathway where AMP gets converted to uric acid. And I just lost my pointer, but uh, so this degradation pathway. And then, but in the meantime, fructose gets um, metabolized through this caloric pathway when you make all these fuels. You make, you make energy, you get your energy back, you, you, st you make stuff that, you, that is basically a stored fuel like fat and, and glycogen, and you, and you make, you can actually use it to help uh, make enzymes and so forth. So, so the, the, here you go and you can uh, see how it normally works. But what we found was that the uric acid, that side chain pathway, actually was driving the insulin resistance. And if we block that pathway, we could block insulin resistance. And if we block that pathway, we could block fructose's ability to, rise, to raise blood pressure. And if we block that pathway, we could block fructose's ability to cause fatty liver. And yet, the, the body could still metabolize fructose. And when we put uric acid on fat cells, we found that, that the fat cells actually uh, increased their fat content excuse me, these are liver cells, they would increase their fat content uh, in response to uric acid. And to make a long story short, uh, our group has found that this side chain pathway is actually what is, is how uh, fructose works to cause obesity and, and uh, insulin resistance, and that when you activate this pathway, it drops the energy in the cell, and that induces hunger and thirst and shifts energy to, uh, preferentially shifts energy to fat and glycogen, induces insulin resistance, raises blood pressure, and it even uh, activates a pathway to hold on water by the kidney. It actually activates uh, hormones that lead to reabsorption of water by the kidney, uh, and it also, by increasing fat, it actually provides a means to store water because although water, fat is immiscible, when you oxidize fat, you actually produce water. And you produce 1.1 gram of, of water for every gram of fat you metabolize. So this becomes this incredible survival pathway. When your energy level goes down, you suddenly want to hold on to, you, you, you get hungry, you get thirsty, you, you become insulin resistant, which actually provides glucose for the brain. You start shifting energy into fat, and reducing your energy metabolism, and you try to store water uh, as, by, by storing fat. So we, we realized that this was actually a conservation of energy pathway. 
So now we're going to go back to that mutation that occurred in the Miocene. And the hypothesis was that perhaps what, if, we block, if that enzyme is blocked, now th this pathway will be amplified, and it should, which should theoretically amplify the conservation energy pathway. So this was a study done by Gabi Sanchez Lozada, who's in the room. And what she did was she said, OK, I'm going to take animals. They have uricase, OK? These animals have uricase. These are rats. So they haven't had the mutation we have had. And I'm going to give them fructose. And I'm going to give them just small amounts of fructose, fructose that hardly do anything in the, in the normal animal. you know. And I'm going to in, inhibit uricase to try to see what the effect of inhibiting uricase would be. So she gave, the, these are rats, and they, she gave a small amount of fructose. It's not enough to raise the uric acid, but she, when she inhibits uricase, it goes up. And here she, she looked at serum triglycerides, and you know, fructose wasn't enough at this dose to really raise triglycerides, but now she inhibits uricase, and it goes way up. She does the same thing with blood pressure, and also looked at fat, fat in the liver. And uh, I should say that uricase inhibition does not do this, uh, does not have quite this power of effect. And so it seemed to be possible that inhibiting uricase could amplify the effects of fructose. So I, I, I began to wonder, you know, okay, so maybe the benefit could be by amplifying the effects of fructose to store fat. So when did this mutation occur? And we just talked about how it was during this period of rapid evolution. And so I decided to, to start reading about the Miocene, the mid, what was going on in the Miocene. And I, I quickly realized that I needed to, to get an expert to help me. And there is this guy named Peter Andrews who trained with Louis Leakey, believe it or not. Not uh, Richard Leakey, but Louis Leakey. And he was uh, a, a major leader, and he is a major leader in anthropology. And his expertise is the mid-Miocene, and he wor works out of the Natural History Museum in London. And I contacted him, and I said, you know, can I come over and visit with you? And he said, yes. And so I went over there, and I went to this museum, and I waited for him, and he came on down, and he took me to this little room, and, I, and he, he let me hold these fossils from like 15 million years ago. It was, it was a fantastic afternoon. And Peter, Peter Andrews was quite a character, and then he told me about what happened during the mid-Miocene. And basically, it's an interesting story. Because the first apes actually emerged in East Africa around 23 million years ago. And these were apes that were actually living primarily in trees and were eating uh, primarily fruit as their diet. And they were very successful. And within three or four million years, there was like eight to 10 species of ape. You know, just in a few million years. Today, there's only uh, four species or five species. And then, uh, so these, these were apes that were living in the rainforest. They were eating mainly fruit, and they were very successful. And they were able to eat fruit all year round. And then, uh, as a friend of mine told me, that a cool wind blew in, to, to, and there was the beginning of climate change. And it began to get cooler. And temperatures began to fall. And, uh, and, and with that temperature falling, ice began to, to build up in the Arctic. The sea levels fell. And for the first time, Africa became a land bridge formed between Africa and Eurasia. And with that formation of the land bridge around 17 million years ago, the apes began to migrate into Turkey and uh, at, uh, Europe and, and these areas, along with aardvarks, giraffes, rhinos. A whole series of animals made this uh, sojourn to, to Europe. And they were successful there because the trees and the fruit were present there all year round. And I should also mention that Peter Andrews is also a paleobotanist who has studied the, the, both the, the flora of that period, too. And he told me that actually the critical food that they ate was a fig. And this fig actually blooms all year round because it's, it's a wasp fig that, that pollinates it and, and it can occur at any time of the year. And so the, the, this particular fig uh, fruits all year round. And he took this picture, actually. 
And unfortunately, global cooling continued. And as global cooling continued, this was a big insight. He told me, he says, you know, the problem with global cooling, just like with global warming, is it's, it affects different parts of the world differently. And in Europe, it started to affect, it was cool, the cooling was enough that it changed the forests and it led to uh, arid, more arid areas and savanna, uh, savannas and uh, a loss of, tro of the tropical forests and, and a loss of the, of the fruit being available all year round. And with that, for the, there was starvation that occurred in Europe, but there wasn't any starvation occurring in Africa because the rainforest just receded. They didn't disappear. And so it was in Eurasia that the apes began to starve. And there's this, this thing that he, he, he found these teeth, and they, 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 this is called linear hypoplasia, enamel hypoplasia. And it looks like the rings of a, of a tree, but this is actually, this is a loss of enamel. And that when you see the rings, it means it's seasonal starvation. And when you see this, it meant that these animals were actually doing well much of the year, but during certain periods of the year, they were actually starving. And so he and I said, oh my gosh, you know, of course, the, because it was seasonal, the cooler seasons, there was a loss of fruit. And actually, it was a time of great uh, change. The animals, the, these early, these ancestral primates had to come out of the tree. They, they had to forage. They, they, had to, they started changing their dentition because they no longer could eat just fruit. They had to eat tubers. Their axial skeleton changed. It was a time of very rapid evolution. And then a terrible thing happened. They became extinct. All the apes in Europe became extinct around 8 million years ago. But what Peter Andrews had, had published, along with a guy named David Bagan, is that by the fossil record, all great apes, from orangutans in Asia to the great apes in Africa, and all have the, the fossil record strongly suggests that it was a European ape that was their ancestor. And so they published a hypothesis called Back to Africa, in which they said there must, before they became extinct, before they all became extinct, a few of them made their way back. And they are our ancestors. So I talked to him about the Europe case mutation, because the Europe case mutation is, is sa the same in the orangutans as is in the great apes as in the humans. And you know, if, if the, they came from Europe, the mutation most likely occurred there. And that's where the survival advantage would be. So suddenly we had a hypothesis. And the hypothesis was that uh, during uh, these animals would eat a lot of fruit. And as it gets ripe, the fructose content goes up. They would get fruit, uh, fatty liver. And then during the period where there wasn't much food available, they would, they would deplete their fat stores. And if they, as, as it got worse and worse, as the seasonal changes got worse, they would actually potentially uh, die. And that would, could be the end. But if there was a mutation that allowed for, for them to amplify their fat stores, some of them could survive. And it would be a survival advantage. And it would occur in Europe, because that's where the, 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 uh, the fruit was not available. Uh, during the, sea, the winter seasons. Now, to actually look at this, I told this hypothesis, and there is this genius named Stephen Benner who was the first one to resurrect an extinct gene. And he really is, you know, the Jurassic Park kind of guy, and he he's resurrected it. He basically started that field, and he had a student named Eric Gache, and Eric said, "I will resurrect that ancestral uracase for you," and with uh, Miguel and Aspa who's uh, here, well, there he is, Miguel, uh, they, they resurrected this extinct gene, which we think was from a Kenya pithecus. And we put, he put the gene into uh, uh, human liver cells. And the normal human liver cells have, have it mutated. So when you put fructose on these cells, the uric acid goes up. The fat goes up in a, in, in a normal person who, in a cell that doesn't have uricase. But if you put the uricase in, you get a blunted response. So it's sort of showing that that mutation really did make a difference. So the, what, the mutation probably only raised the uric acid a little bit. And we did this study in the San Diego Zoo. And the apes that have the uricase mutation, they have uric acids of around two to three. And we did a study in Yanomami Indians from southern Venezuela who were eating their native diets. And they also had a uric acid of three. And in 1900, Studies suggest that uh, in America, 
that Americans had uric acids of around three. But over the last 80 years, 100 years, the uric acid levels have been going up in our population. And they, they go up every decade. And now the labs change what's normal for uric acid every decade. And why is that? And it's because of the introduction of sugar and a lot of other foods, but sugar in particular. And sugar was really introduced in sugar cane was discovered in the Ganges River Valley, Balaji. Uh, and, uh, and it was discovered around 500 BC. They, they were able to make the sugar and then it entered China and Persia and Egypt. And then it was brought in through Venice into, into Europe. And initially it was very expensive. And the first reports of obesity and diabetes were by Shushruta, who was in the Ganges River Valley. And I got his old, I found his, this uh, uh, translation of the, of the Sanskrit. It was like a 1,500 page thing. But if you use Google Scholar, you can just ask, you can just say search, you go, you write words for sugar, sweet, treacle. And suddenly, this 1,000 page book, you can go straight to page 777. And there it is. <laughs> He, he was the first one to report diabetes and obesity, and he actually linked it with sweet liquids. And then when sugar was brought into Europe, initially it was the rich, and the rich and the royalty who could afford sugar. And you have King Charles the Fat, Sancho the Fat, Saxius the Fat, William the Conqueror. He was accused of being pregnant, he was so fat. <laughs> Louis the, 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 the Sixth, King John of England, St. Thomas Aquinas. Here's this one. King Edward I of England, he ordered 1,800 pounds of sugar for the royal household in 1287 and 6,258 pounds in 1288. They loved sugar. And the poor couldn't afford sugar. Back then, in 1400, one pound of sugar equaled 28 pounds of cheese or 34 dozen eggs. This was, sugar was for the rich. St. Thomas Aquinas, he decided that sugar was so important that not only that it could be considered a medicinal, and therefore you could eat it during the fast. <laughs> and he went on to become very obese. He loved sugar. And then, of course, sugar was, sugar cane was introduced. I mean, uh, the plantations, sugar was brought to America. Sugar plantations started producing large amounts of sugar. Sugar was brought back to England. And, uh, and then sugar production started increasing throughout the world with the sugar beets and so forth. And you can see here, this is uh, uh, looking at how much sugar the average person was uh, ingesting per year. It was around four pounds in 18, 1700, 18 pounds per year in 1800, 90 pounds per year in 1900, and 150 pounds per year in 2000. And this is uh, based upon disappearance data, so it's a little bit of an old, uh, so it's based upon how much sugar is uh, re being removed from grocery stores and so forth. So how much is going home, but it doesn't really say exactly how much is being eaten, but it's a, it's a good uh, guess of, of how much people were eating. And if you look at it, the sugar intake correlates greatly with the obesity intake and also with diabetes rates. And, and so now we're going to make a shift. So we've found this conservation pathway. It's involved in, uh, we've heard about this mutation and how climate change may have affected uh, may, it may have been a survival advantage to have this mutation back then, but today that mutation is increasing our risk for obesity and diabetes. But now we have a new challenge because climate change is, is occurring now. And climate it, temperatures have maybe only gone up 0.8 to 1 degree centigrade, but global warming is, is, is actually increasing the number of heat extremes. And so the, the heat extremes are increasing mar much more than just this uh, mild increase in mean temperature. And really, you know, exemplifying how severe this is, last year the, the, the heat got so great at, that uh, in Iran, there was a, a day when the heat index got to 165 degrees. And as you all know, this has been one of the hottest years on record. And be, related to this has been this emergence of epidemics of kidney disease, uh, primarily in these tropical regions, like in Central America. Every place you see where there's a yellow circle, there's been an epidemic of kidney disease developing, of chronic kidney disease. And in this area, there's been over 20,000 deaths. I mean, this is an active problem. And uh, there's also epidemics going on in India and Sri Lanka, and there's probably some going on in uh, Thailand. 
And what's interesting is that it's mainly agricultural workers and the, it's different types of crops, but sugarcane, banana, corn, rice, cashew. And so there's been this question of what's driving that epidemic. And uh, to, so to describe what's going on, it's usually people working outside manually in these hot environments. And what we found is that these people are, there's a very common risk factor. They're getting recurrent heat stress and dehydration. And, uh, and they're often poor and, and disadvantaged. So could, are we maladapted because of the, these mutations that occurred in our past for, for this environmental challenge? Because we had this mutation occur during global cooling and now, now we're in global warming. So we're gonna go back to this mutation and I'm almost done with my talk. And we, we, uh, there is, we're gonna go back to that mutation and you know, that enzyme normally regulated the blood level of uric acid. But now we got rid of what regulates the blood level. And so there were actually mutations that occurred in parallel with the loss of uricase to let the kidney take over the, the metabolism of uric acid. Not the metabolism, but the excretion of uric acid. And what we've got now is we have transporters that are activated to basically, when uric acid's levels are low, it tries to enhance reabsorption, and when uric acid starts getting high, these uh, actually we try to excrete the uric acid. But our serum uric acid is higher now, and now these guys are out there working in the fields, and heat and exercise are known to cause low-grade muscle injury, re which releases DNA from the muscles. And remember I told you that uric acid is a breakdown product of DNA? And that metabolism of DNA increases the serum uric acid. And these workers have uric acid levels that are extremely high. And what we found is that the, with, with the absence of the uricase, the kidneys are, cannot handle it because their, their urine is concentrated. They, they, and, and the amount of uric acid that gets in the urine exceeds the solubility and it starts to form crystals. And, and we got urine from these uh, uh, sugarcane workers. And Carlos Roncal, who's here in the audience, somewhere, this is actually his work, but we took sugarcane workers and we found that they often had these big sediments in their urine, and when we looked under the microscope, they were filled with crystals. And what was really interesting is we did a study with sugarcane workers where we got morning and afternoon urines at different times during the year. And about 15% of the time, we found these crystals. But one day, we had seven subjects, and all of them had sky-high uric acid levels in the urine, and these are levels that are, are, are well known to cause kidney damage. Anything over 100 is like really bad. And we had some with 200, you know? And, and so I was curious, why did all seven have injury on that, one, that same day? And so I, I Googled, and I found out that it was one of the hottest days of the year, the day before. And that's why I worry about heat waves. That's why I worry that this could be climate change could be affecting and causing this kidney disease because these guys are out there working. They're used to working every day with a, the with a temperature being at a certain level. And now if a heat wave comes in and they're not prepared and they're not drinking enough, they, it may just overwhelm them. And it all goes back to a mutation that occurred in our past. So survival of the fittest requires three major functions. The ability to find and store food and water to avoid predators, to survive catastrophes, and to continue to be able to reproduce. Evolution accelerates during periods of environmental stress as mutations with subtle advantage may take over when current mechanisms are failing. A conservation of energy pathway has been identified that activates pathways to reduce energy me metabolism and to allow the conservation of fat and water. But it comes with a cost because the shear case mutation uh, now, we now all have it. And during a period of global cooling and near extinction, these an our ancestors acquired this mutation in uricase that accelerated this conservation pathway, providing a survival advantage at that time. But now this mutation is an increase in our sensitivity to sugar and fructose, an increase in our risk for obesity and diabetes, and, diabetes, and it's also increasing our risk for kidney disease in the setting of heat stress. And so, I want to give special thanks to the four investigators uh, who, who have done the most on this. Uh, Miguel Anaspa, uh, who's uh, a brilliant scientist who's not only been identifying this conservation pathway, but how, 
how it leads to metabolic syndrome, even in, and how climate change may have an effect on metabolic syndrome. Carlos Roncal, a brilliant, another brilliant scientist who uh, d figured out these urate crystals and how dehydration causes kidney damage, uh, chronic kidney damage. Gabi Sanchez Luzada, who's been an expert in fructose metabolism and uric acid metabolism, and Peter Andrews, my friend from uh, London. And then there are all these other investigators I want to thank, especially, hey, Tom, Tom Jensen, one of our fellows, uh, and uh, I, I, there are many more. So I want to end, and, and I'll end with there. And, and we, we sort of have a thrifty gene. If, we, if you've ever heard of Jim, Jim Neal had proposed that, that in our past there might have been genes that provided survival advantage back then that now are turning against us. And I think that's what we found. Thank you very much.